Wow. Thank you, Jean, is it? Thank you. That was beautiful. I think, what is that wonderful, beautiful Savior? I think it is. Ah, oh, wonderful. I love that song. I was singing some of the words, at least the ones I remember while you were playing. Thank you so much. Well, Laguna Nigel Church, it's good to be with you today, especially during the summer months when you live in Riverside County. It's good to, uh, I mean, my wife and I got out of the car and I was like, ah, oh, do you smell that ocean breeze? It feels good. Now, I've been blessed in that Two weeks ago, I was in San Diego County, North County. Last Sabbath, we were in Costa Mesa, and today we're in Laguna Niguel. And so I love how the Lord has organized my preaching schedule so far this summer. And uh, you pray for my associate, Will Pennick. I don't know if he's been here yet or not, but uh, last Sabbath when I was in Costa Mesa, he was in Blythe. So I said, partner, what are you doing, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. Uh, but we have quite a large territory here in Southeastern California Conference, five, five counties, and uh, we try to serve all of our churches in every way we can. And so uh, Pastor Gary, as you know, who is interim pastor here, had a previously, previous commitment to preach on this date, and so uh, uh, the conference administration asked if I was available and to come and to also introduce Ben. And so it's good to have Ben here. And uh, we're excited to have you in Southeastern California Conference uh, and uh, be involved as one of our pastors. Excited. Also just want to thank again Pastor Tanya and Pastor Lynette. And uh, I also do want to just continue to express uh, appreciation for uh, your previous senior pastor, Pastor Joseph, and the, the time and energy he put into building this congregation up. And uh, he is a, a special part of our conference here and part of our pastoral team as well. And uh, last time I was with you, I was by myself, but today I am blessed my wife came with me today, Lisa, who's hiding back there just behind, next to the soundboard. Can you just raise your hand maybe to see there? And so, yeah, thank you. Really do applaud her because she puts up a lot with me. Uh, we celebrated 36 years of marriage just the other week, so I am blessed. We met when we were 18 years old, 18 years old. Now look how old we are, right? Gray hair. But uh, we met when we were 18 years old in college and uh, never looked back. And uh, it's been a joy to be married to Lisa. And uh, so I got married 36 years ago and started, Ben, started ministry 35 years ago. So uh, you got a long road ahead of you and it's rich and it's awesome and it's, it's amazing. It is, it is great. Well, today I... Uh, I want to share with you a message I call the good, good news. We've heard of the good news. We've heard of the good news. The gospel is the good news, right, for humanity. I like to say it's the good, good news. And I hope that by the time I'm done with today's sermon, you'll understand why I refer to it as the good, good news. Now, it was mentioned earlier that they're going to take Ben out surfing. And I said, Ben, make sure when they take you out, they take you to Dana Point the first time, right? Where it's nice and easy rolling, you know, it doesn't pitch too hard, and you're not going to get stuck on the inside section. Don't let them take you to a beach break where you're going to get... Because surfers like to watch newbies kind of get worked a little bit, you know, so they appreciate it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So uh, watch out for the sabotage, okay? Um, but I share that story because when I was 14 years old, it was the first time I took out a surfboard. I was a freshman in high school, and my first time was Dana Point. Went out nice and easy and soft. And then some of you who, who might be aware as well, we went to the secret spot after that, which is no longer a secret, and it hasn't been for a long time because the Ritz-Carlton purchased all of that property up on the bluff. But back in the day, that was kind of the secret spot, and I got worked. Well... That same year, I went out on the 4th of July at Newport Beach, and I still hadn't even learned how to stand up yet. I was a total newbie. But, you know, when you're 14 and you're carrying a surfboard, that's all that matters is what you look like, right? It's kind of walking the beach, right? So I go out, and it's really big, and I get worked, and then the lifeguards put out those flags. You may be familiar with those yellow flags with the black ball inside of it, and it means don't take a hard board out between these two flags. So I said, all right, well, I'll go out body surfing, which was not very bright because, again, it was a really big day. 
So I went out to go body surfing, and I just, the waves just pounded me again and again. So I, I got caught on the inside, and as I looked up, this wave just hit me and drove me down. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, when you're underneath the water, and you're tumbling and you're turning so much, you don't know which way is up. And so you think you're going up, but you may be going down. And I didn't feel like I was getting to the surface anytime soon. I finally make it up, get my breath, and the next thing I know, there's another wave crashing on me. And it drives me down again. This happens a few times. So much so, it gets to the point to where when I'm starting to go up to the surface, I'm losing all my air, and now I'm starting to drink water. Uh, if you've been there, I hope I'm not traumatizing any PTSD, anybody who's experienced that. I had somebody the last time I was sharing this story, that happened to me, and I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry, I traumatized you all over again. But I, I came up, and I'm <clears throat> coughing, and, every, and I get hit by a wave again, and I just, I start to accept the fact that at 14 years of age, I'm probably going to drown. I'm probably going to die on the 4th of July. My family's on the beach, and you start seeing your life, you know, all 14 years just start to go by you. You said, well, I, I, I'm not going to see my family again. I'm not going to. And you start having all those fears. Well, I don't know about you, but, but I'm going to ask. What, when you're in a situation like that, what do you typically start doing? Praying, right? Of course. You start praying. You're like, God, please save me. God. If, and, then, and then if the prayers don't seem to work, what do you do next? Exactly. You start, well, I didn't negotiate. I just started making promises, right? <laughs> I just said, God, if you save me, I promise I'll do this. I prom now, I grew up with three older sisters. Some of you feel my pain, right? <laughs> I grew up with three older sisters, so I had four moms, okay? You can also figure I was spoiled rotten as well, okay? But I, I promised God, God, if you save me, I'll be nice to my sisters. That's a big promise. That's a big promise. Anyways, obviously I'm here today, right? But what happened was I came up, and there was this guy swimming by. You probably know who he is. He had this red flotation device. <laughs> he came swimming by, and he says, hey, do you need some help? Now, why are some of you laughing? Because you probably know that the ego of a 14-year-old guy who wants to be a surfer is pretty big. Can you imagine my ego was so big that when he says, hey, do you need any help? I said, no, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm still stunned by the fact. And fortunately, he was a good lifeguard. And he said, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up and he wrapped that thing around me and he says, I'm taking you in. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> he didn't believe me. Thank God. So I have a question for you. <clears throat> Did he just stumble upon me? Was he just out there swimming? I mean, it was the 4th of July. You know what the beach is like on 4th of July. If you've ever been to Newport Beach, we, we nicknamed it Zooport Beach, right, because it's so packed. In fact, I remember that day, like, you could barely walk without stepping on other people's towels and, you know, being careful not to kick sand. And there were so many people, so many people. I remember watching, I didn't, I don't, I didn't watch the news at 14, but it was on, and it was on, and, and they talked about all the record rescue numbers that day. And I thought, I was one of those rescues that day. But he didn't just happen, he wasn't just drifting out in the water, and I, I, just by chance, he saved my life. It was an act of intentionality. This lifeguard had been watching me. He was at a station, and he, he was on all the time watching, as well as all the other lifeguards, and he saw me out there struggling. He saw those waves pounding me and drilling me down. He saw me coming up and going under again and going, and so much so that at one point, he goes, if I don't leave this place and go down into there and, and rescue him, he's going to die. And if you've ever seen a lifeguard do a rescue, they don't go, oh, let me make sure my shop's locked up. You know, let me make sure I look good. Let me get crawl down the stairs. They, they jump, right? They jump and they sprint down the beach. Now, I don't know how he did it that day. Well, usually they have a path cleared. 
But he sprinted, and I'm sure he dove, because he knew every second mattered if I was going to be alive or not. I tell you this story because I want, it's important for us as Adventist Christians to remember that Almighty God left heaven intentionally to come down here and rescue you, to save your life. It's called grace. It's called grace. That Philippians 2 says that he emptied himself, he humbled himself and left heaven to come down here and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, to save you and I. And so we have been redeemed. We've been reconciled. By grace, you and I have been saved through faith. It's important for us, as we look at the good news of the gospel, that we remember all God has done, that while, while we were dead in our transgressions, in fact, I want to look at some of those texts, this is what I call the transactional side of the gospel message. Let me just share a few texts with you. You might know this one, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? All right. Now, that was six of you. If we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from how much unrighteousness? Awe. Oh. Isn't that good news, church? If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Or how about this one? I love this one, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift, church. That's why we're here. That's why we worship, because we haven't earned anything. It's strictly the gift of God by his grace that we are forgiven and we are made right with God and we receive eternal life. So what do you do when you can't pay for it? You give thanks and you worship. You say, thank you, God. Thank you. I want to take a long one. Bear with me on this one. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And here's my favorite conjunction in the whole Bible. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For, here he says it again, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not works, so that no one can boast. Are you hearing this this morning, church? None of us can say, but I did this. While we were sinners, while we were steeped in our transgressions, Christ died for us. His great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. Now let me just marinate there for a second, okay? My last name's Ciccarelli. I'm Italian. So it's important for us to marinate in things every once in a while, right? So when it says, for it is by grace you have been saved, we just can't go over that lightly. When you look at the original uh, language of the Bible, the Koine Greek of the Bible, and you look at that, and you look at the grammar of that, in fact, Ben probably, you know, fresh out of college, can come here and parse this for us and just lay it out for us. So don't, don't critique me afterwards, okay? But what this, this verb tense is this past, I want to say past perfect tense that shows something happened and it continues to happen forever. It keeps going on. So when it says you have been saved by grace, it doesn't just mean you were saved in the past. It means he saved you from your sins in the past and you are saved from your sins through forgiveness for your future. And so we have the gift of eternal life. 
God is so good, church. How about this passage, Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You see, Adventist Christians are people who have said, the only place to stand in this life is in the grace of God. I'm going to boast in the grace of God, and I'm going to stand in that grace. That's what Paul was saying right in the middle there of Romans. We stand in the grace. We're counting on the grace of God. And so, church, this is what I call, and I mentioned it before, the transactional side of the good news. The, 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 the side that has all those, those big, uh, as one of my professors used to say, those big 50-cent words, you know. We are justified. The justification the redemption and reconciliation, all of these things that make us right with God. We're made right with God because of what Christ has done for us on the cross in his life, death, and resurrection. And he came here because, you know this one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, remember? So anyone who believes in him should have eternal life and not perish. And I love verse 17. He didn't send him into the world to, what, condemn the world, but to save the world. And so there's the transactional sides, but the reason why I'm going with the good, good news is because church, sometimes in my growing up as an Adventist Christian and in my experience with Christians in general, sometimes we stop with the transactional side and we forget there's a whole nother side to the gospel that's a result of the transactional side. And I call it the transformational side. You see, it's not just about believing the right things. And I, I, you know, last time I was here, I spoke openly and honestly, and I'll do the same. Church, I'm just going to say, as Adventists, we put a lot of emphasis on, on believing the right things. Amen? Some of you are convinced. Some of you say we should believe in the wrong things. I'm just kidding. But as Adventists, we talk about the truth. We talk about believing the right things and teaching the right things. And church, that's a wonderful part of the gospel. But there's a difference between believing in Jesus and believing the things Jesus believed. Are you with me? There's a world of difference. I can believe in Jesus all I want and miss out on the fullness of the gospel because I don't actually believe the things that Jesus believed. If some of you are going, Pastor John's kind of going off the deep end here. But think about it, church. We must take this very seriously. Because the great gospel commission is because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. He tells us, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have given you. And I will be with you even to the end of the age. So you see, last time I was here, I talked about the problem, the crisis we have with discipleship. And at the very heart of the Great Gospel Commission is go make disciples. And sometimes we think that just when we baptize and when we teach, we're done. Well, let me tell you, I got baptized at the age of 12 years old. Was that the birthing and the finish line at the same time? I mean, I got baptized. But he says, go make disciples. What does that mean? Disciple means a learner. Go make them a student of mine. Go make them a learner of mine. That means that we are growing and learning how to live life at the feet of Jesus. Because he's our master and our teacher and our Lord and our rabbi. And so we have the transactional side. Thank you, Jesus. My sins are forgiven. And the rest of the good, good news is that he invites us into the transformational side. Transactional could say, come to me. Transformational will say, now come follow me. Be my disciple, and I will teach you to actually not just believe the things about me, but I will teach you to start thinking like I think. I will renew your mind. I will renew your heart. I will transform your will to be more and more like mine. It's called abundant living. The abundant life that Jesus talked about. 
You see, it's important for us to understand that while we have been saved by grace, it's important for us to stand in the grace of God and say, God, I'm counting you and your power and the presence of your Holy Spirit to do the things in me, in my heart, in my head, in my will that I cannot do. Let's take, for instance, Jesus says, a new command I give to you, love one another. Does he stop there? No. He says, love one another like I have loved you. That's a whole different kind of love, church. It's easy to just love people, however I define love, but when Jesus says, love one another like I have loved you, he's talking about sacrificial love, being willing to lay down your life. He's talking about maybe ministering to people that the organized church might even say, no, we can't minister to those people. Be careful. If you go there, you might actually become like them. Isn't that what Jesus was criticized for? Jesus was criticized so much for that that he was actually considered a drunkard. There were religious leaders in Jesus' day who believed all the right things about God, but they missed the Messiah. They missed the one who said, I am. They missed the one who said, before Abraham was, I am. But he was coming. He was coming to say, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is right near you because he was there. The kingdom of God has come, and that's what the Beatitudes are all about. He says, everyone is blessed because the kingdom of God has come to you. Whether you're in a state of mourning or you're poor, or it doesn't matter your circumstances. The kingdom of God has come, and the door is wide open through my life. You don't have to have a certain amount of power. You don't have to have a certain amount of money. You don't have to do certain things because that's, that's what the church in that day was saying. But that's why he said, blessed are you because the kingdom of God is here. A lot of theologians say, you know, you have Moses on the mountain with the Ten Commandments and all, all that's there. On the Sermon on the Mount, this was God showing this is the new Moses. This is the new leader. These Beatitudes are the new commandments. And Jesus goes way beyond behavior to intention, right? He talks about adultery. No, if you lust after a woman. Well, what about killing somebody? No, if you hate somebody. See, Jesus is getting, he says, what comes out of the heart is what matters. And church, the good news is that while he forgives us, and because of his justification and and his reconciliation of us, we get to now enter the kingdom of God. And the great part of the good news is that we don't have to wait till Jesus comes again to live under the reign of Jesus Christ. We get to do that now while on earth. And that's why Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. Because here is where we decide if God reigns or not in our life. And no matter what anybody does to you or I, they can't change that he is Lord of our life, that he is our king, and that we are part of his reign in his kingdom. That's why when he taught his disciples to pray right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, how did he teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What did he say next? Your kingdom come, your will be done. When and where? On earth as it is in heaven. That's not a kingdom we're waiting for, church. That's a kingdom that has come in Jesus Christ and is poured out through the Holy Spirit and is offered to every single one of us. Come live under my reign. You see, when that happens, when that happens, then when Jesus comes back again, he's not a stranger. But he's a friend. And he's someone we've been close to because he's been living in our heart. Let me share this, this scripture with you. This is one of my favorite scriptures in all all of scripture. It's in Galatians 2.20. You may know this. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. There's this conjunction again. But what? Christ lives where? Can you just say that again? Where? In me. But Christ lives in me. The life I when now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just can you just look at that passage for us? Let's marinate there again, okay? This is a text that maybe some of us know, but we need to really live there. 
I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see? The kingdom of God lives within us when we allow Christ to live in us. And it's not something that happens when the trumpets sound. It happens when we say, yes, Jesus. I want to enter your kingdom and I want you to be Lord of my life. I not only want you to be Savior, I want you to be Lord. There's a Christian philosopher uh, named Dallas Willard. He taught philosophy at USC for years, and he was a Christian. And he said this. Now, just bear with me. It's kind of funny, but there's a lot of truth to it. He says, there's too many vampire Christians in the world. There's too many vampire Christians in the world. I'm like, what is it? Dallas, what are you saying? There's too many vampire Christians in the world. They just want Jesus for his blood. Wow. Come on, Dallas. Jesus doesn't just want to forgive our sins, and I say just very carefully, but he wants to see us made whole. He wants to see our hearts and our minds renewed with his spirit. He wants to see us saved from ourselves, from our own wills. That which I don't do, I do, and that which I do, I don't do, and I, the frustration. And someone asked Dallas a question too. They said, well, Dallas, with all this you're talking about, about life in the Spirit and all of this, how do you take Romans chapter 7? Now listen to this. This is simple but so profound. How do you take Romans chapter 7, that which I want to do, I don't do, and you know, the, the, the struggle there? And he goes, well, I usually take it with Romans chapter 8. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on and talks about life in the Spirit. And that through the Spirit we cry, Abba. And it talks about at the very end of eight that nothing can separate us from the love of God. You see, church, I need to check my time. You see, church, thank God for the transactional side of the good news. And it's really important for us to understand and remember that another part of the good news is the transformational side of Christ in us. That you and I are never alone for one second. Because Christ lives in you. And even when you or I feel alone, and it's okay to feel it, we have feelings. Oh, don't deny your feelings. And I don't, when I say don't deny, there's a difference between denying your feelings and denying your desires, okay? Because <laughs> sometimes we think, oh, just do whatever you feel. No, we have feelings and we need to own those. Trust me, I know I'm married to a therapist. She's helped me with that for 36 years, okay? I joke and say I've been in therapy for 36 years. I hope I'm further down the road now than I was. I, to be honest with you, when we first got married, this will show you what, a, what an amazing godly woman she is. I didn't even know how to share a feeling. Seriously, I'm not making it up. And she would ask me how I felt, and I was always telling her what I thought. She goes, that's not a feeling, that's your thought. And I'd be, don't tell me what I'm feeling, that's what I feel. You know? And then the first time I shared a feeling, she was so happy. She goes, you did it. And I go, I did what? She goes, you shared a feeling. I go, I did. <laughs> I didn't even realize it. But you may feel alone. You may feel down. And know that Jesus is with you and in you. That's where faith comes in. Faith is acting on your belief, you see? And so by allowing Christ to live in us and to reign in us and remembering that through the presence of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in us, we are being formed and transformed so that we actually start believing the things that Jesus believed. We actually start believing the things that Jesus believes in. And as we continue to grow in this process, another 50 cent word of sanctification, of grace transforming our lives and rewiring our neurons, we actually become more and more like Jesus, not to earn favor because we already have God's favor, right? He showed it to us by sending his son. But that we can grow so that as John the Baptist said that he might increase and I might decrease. Wouldn't we all be a little happier if there was more Jesus reigning in our life than ourselves? I know I would. I know I would. There are times, now I'll be honest with you, you're probably, you probably don't have this issue at all. But you know, when I get on the 91 freeway, 
and the 10 freeway and the, and, and I tell my wife, I'm pretty sure people are on crack while they're driving these days. You ever feel that? And I'm like, what on earth, you know? And there are times when somebody, I mean, you, you almost don't know if they're doing it on purpose. Like, to, to cut you that close. And I sit there, and I'm like, hey, my Italian stallion wants to come out, you know? And thankfully, most days, the spirit perks up and says, not today, Satan. <laughs> not today, Satan. Turn that worship music up a little louder, John. Focus on me. Focus on me. Because church the other part of the good news is what we just read. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that good news, church? It doesn't get better than that. Anything else we're pursuing in this life outside of letting Christ reign in us is temporary. Has no, it's not going to last for eternity. And when Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit in John 15, he says, because apart from me, you can do nothing. So in other words, anything that has to do with kingdom growth and eternal value only happens by Christ reigning inside of us. Everything else is temporal. And so Jesus invites us, and I'm not going to go into too much here, but he invites us into that yoke of relationship. Right? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble in heart, humble and gentle in heart, and you will, you will receive rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's good news, church. It's good news. I want to close with one last brief story. I was sharing the story of me almost drowning. Uh, that I shared with you with some administrators from the Atlantic Union Conference. And some of them were administrators from uh, Bermuda. And uh, after the session we had together, this, uh, this administrator came up to me and said, I had a story almost just like that. It totally reminded me of my story. And I said, well, and I, and I assumed she was going to tell me about it, and she did. And she said, now the difference is in Bermuda, our... our our beaches are very shallow. We don't have like a lot of deep water. So she said, I was drowning out there and, and I was screaming, help me, help me, help me. And she goes, and I looked up and there was this lifeguard standing right next to me in the water. <laughs> now some of you have got it and some of you will get that as you're driving home. She was in shallow water. She didn't know she could stand up. She thought she was going to die, and she's kicking and screaming and saying, rescue me. And the, can you imagine the lifeguard? Hey, stand up. <laughs> and she went, oh, and she stood up. Church, we can believe all the wonderful things that we find in the Bible. But until we take them to heart, until we say, Jesus, you reign in my heart, I surrender all, we'll never stand in the grace of God. I want to encourage you. You've been made right with God because of his favor. And not only made right with God, he says, I will live in your very being. You are my new temple. You are my temple where I reside. And wherever you go, as you love others like I've loved you, God reigns. God reigns. Let's pray. Jesus, we recognize that you alone are our Savior and you alone are our King. And so Jesus... Thank you that every single day your word says your mercies are new. Thank you that every single day your word says your grace is sufficient, which logically speaking means your grace is never insufficient for our lives. And so, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we want to be steeped in this reality, in the reality of the kingdom of God of your presence in us and through us. And so may we know that as we go, as we are gathered here this morning, but as we are scattered during the week, your kingdom 
goes about everywhere we live and work and play. And may we enjoy the fullness of the good, good gospel and good news. Would you take a moment now just in silent prayer? Maybe you want to just say a silent prayer in the stillness of your heart and your mind for God to express what you're thinking or feeling in this moment. Or maybe you just want to be still and know that he is God and just listen to what he might have for you. To a close, okay. as we bring our service to a close, maybe you could join and stand with me. And as we sing the words of this song, Blessed Assurance, we can remember the good, good news. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior am and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. My story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story, this is my song. And now as we go, may we go knowing we are blessed by the favor of God and enjoying his presence within us as we go about our week this week. God bless you.